Tylea's Troubles, Behind the Scenes Video 2. Three Scratch Builds. This video shows the building of three of the unique war engines that have already appeared in the story so far. Two are human, Tylean creations, and one is ogre built. The first is a kit bash of a Caroccio, a mobile war altar. I was using the mercenary army list from an old internet campaign called Treachery and Greed, and I wanted the model to have everything the list's description suggested. A battle standard, a minimum of six crew, some religious trappings, and the sort of firepower that could counter six handgun shots per turn. I also wanted some height, so that it had a, a good line of sight on the field of battle, but mainly to help it look a bit more impressive in my usual low fantasy sort of way. Here you can see it completed, but uncrewed. In this early incarnation, uh, used in the old internet campaign, the standard was an extra fancy version of the mercenary Compagna del Sole's white baton and sun emblem, a composite of Mimidian symbols. You can see a simpler, more common version of that same emblem painted on some of the panels. A golden statue of Mimidia is mounted at the front. The figure had been in my bits box many years, I've had no idea where it came from. The game world story was that it was taken from outside Archpriest Condlamar's palace. He was my character back in that campaign. Two torches illuminate the golden goddess. This picture includes the crew and a priestess tending to the statue with suitable chants and prayers. There are six handgunners, four on the top, two in the cage, as well as three swivel guns with optional stanchions, the red posts, for mounting the swivels as necessary. The flag also swivelled, due to being made in such a way that I could easily swap it, but it also meant I could reposition it for photos. The model was going to bear several different flags in the future years. This shot looks into the cage part, an iron grilled area beneath the tower platform. Luckily, two of the models were just short enough to stand in there, and I love the three-dimensional nature of having them tucked away inside, sticking their gun muzzles through the bars. The handgunners are old Grenadier miniatures arquebusier from the 1980s onwards, currently available from Merliton. I need to get some more of this range for upcoming campaign possibilities. I built the model from a variety of old scenery leftovers, like plastic doors and windows, as well as two spare horses, some plasticard tubes and the wheels and yoke for an old Games Workshop black coach model. Eventually I realised just how unprotected the horses looked, so that the later Morite version would have different horses with metal armour barding, much more likely to survive in battle. I was, and remain, aware that to demand two horses should pull all this ironwork is entirely unreasonable, but hey, fantasy. Later in the campaign, you'll see what happened to the Caroccio, and how eventually it ended up with not one, not two, not three, but four pairs of draft animals. But that's in the far future. I cut a crossbow arm sprue piece with a scalpel to make the stanchion, the mount for the swivel guns, using the stirrup at the end of the crossbows to pass through the holes and into the sides of the guns. The Caroccio's main body was built from lollipop sticks, with thin bits of plasticard stuck on top so I could glue the railings on. There was a lot of chopping of plastic, as, as most bits were the wrong size. Luckily, the curving iron tops on the lower level match the wooden ones on the top level because they were alternative parts for the, say, windows in some castle scenery. The only things I bought specially for this project were the swivel guns. They're model shop pieces from my local model shop. Of course, the shop shut down years ago. I couldn't bring myself to break the ones I already had off their stands and leave my pirate army with three less swivels. And I'm extra glad I didn't do so now because they were used for the Green Corsairs and later would be used by the Sartosan pirates. Here you can see the Caroccio being paraded through the streets in that previous campaign. Entirely as troubles, it became a Morite Caroccio. And so the flag has changed and I repainted the panels. Instead of a golden statue, there's now a chest carrying holy relics. Next up is another scratch build project, a Tylian steam tank. 
Having already made the Caraccio, I was hankering after a steam tank. I'd never had one before, uh, first because of expense and later because it wasn't my style on the tabletop. I, I, I always aimed at theme, not competitive min-maxing. I think I'm using that term right. What I was wanting was a steam tank light, with stats reflecting less armour and probably weaker armament than the official Empire Army version. In the end, I decided I could mount the old Hellblaster model I had just bought second-hand, as well as several smaller artillery pieces as swivels. Here are some pictures of the early work-in-progress stages of this perhaps ambitious scratch-build project. The innards I made out of bits of pens, toy barrel, plastic rods and the engine wheels from some cheap plastic toys that came wrapped in chocolate. The wheels are metal, bought at a war games convention way back. I knew I'd find some future use for them. The rods sticking out of the bottom were supposed to have a chain wrapped around to connect the steering wheel with the little truck of wheels at the front. But once I realised none of it would be seen, I wondered whether to bother, as it, it would be a really fiddly process. Here it is, sticky tacked together to see if it would fit. This picture is a guide to what is what, or at least what the various parts are supposed to do. Like I mentioned, I'm a low fantasy sort of guy, so I always want things to look convincing, like they might actually work. A chain loop would run from the steering column right back to the clump of four wheels. I knew it wasn't as sleek as a whip staff, but I'm not that clever. I built the mechanism without thinking about how I would add fighting platforms or weapons or armour. I decided I, I'll, I'll worry about that later, as if the machine had to be this way and the game world designer, one maestro Angelo De Leone, would just have to work out how to add the superstructure to the existing engine after the engine was built. Some bits still needed clipping off, otherwise the movement of its mechanism would be hindered, but I'd learned from bitter experience when scratch building and sewing to make bits longer than I think they need to be because too long can be corrected much more easily than too short. After completing the project, I realised I had made a weird big mistake. The engine now moved in entirely the opposite direction to that which I had originally planned. Somewhere along the way, I'd accidentally flipped its proposed direction of travel around in my addled mind, and thus needing to build the prow around the moving rod, pumping back and forth out the front. That rod, of course, should have been pumping freely out of the back. Next time I'll get it right. The engine's design is based on my Skaven Warp Lightning Cannon, which will feature in the campaign video's far future. That was actually built using an airfix kit of Trevithick's early 19th century steam engine. Here, I didn't try to represent all the parts and pipes, however, as although I'm a low fantasy aficionado who wants things to look functional, I reckon it still looked convincing. So I left the mechanism as is. Besides, I didn't know which pipes were meant to do what. And importantly, as I found out later, the engine was not particularly visible when the model was completed, being surrounded almost entirely by timber. It's not easy to get hard polystyrene to stick to the annoyingly ungluable waxy version that a lot of these scavenged toy bits are made of. Or any glue for that matter. I've sewn things onto this sort of plastic in the past. This model was too small and fiddly for sewing. So this time I scored crisscrossed lines with a scalpel to give a better surface on the waxy plastic for the glue to hold on to. And also, when gluing wood to hard polystyrene, I put plastic glue on the plastic, PVA on the wood, and then joined the two parts together, thus mixing the glues. It seems to have worked. Or should I say, hasn't fallen apart yet. Here the pictures show a later stage. I was suffering doubts about it at this stage, not, not sure I liked it at all. I was fairly happy with the engine and the truck parts, even with the oddly angled wooden armour. hadn't realised that the wooden side walls would lean outwards until I put my lollipop stick shields together, nor that the whole thing would be angled down towards the front. But it seemed OK if a somewhat organic design. The strange angles can't really be seen in the pictures. I also wished I'd modelled it to travel the other way, because if the big piston type thing was thrusting out the back, then the crew could peer through forward slits to see where they were going. What I was really uncertain about was the work in progress gun platform. It just didn't seem right. It looked ugly, and its supporting frame didn't look anywhere near strong enough. Not if a hell blaster was going to be up there. I was reluctant to start the platform again, making it all wooden instead of iron panels. In the end, 
I decided it needed something in between the lower sections and the top sections, some more panelling or some sort of iron bars. I decided extra bracing was, was the way to go. I'd also forgotten about the smokestack. There's one on my Skaven steam engine, so now was the time to get looking in my bits boxes. I like the idea that in the game world, the smoke and steam might make this engine appear more frightening, like a fire-breathing dragon, as well as according some sort of soft cover to the, to the crew. I also wondered whether I should have some sort of canopy above the gun platform. I didn't want the guys getting sunstroke while being steamed and smoked and tending a hot gun. And it'd pretty fire it up too. Or maybe it would just become a fire hazard. I knew the gun decks on fighting ships circa 1560 to the mid-19th century were not particularly comfortable and that World War I tanks were ridiculously uncomfortable. My low fantasy mind could live with the idea of great discomfort, but a canopy might finish it off as a model. The old figures I was going to use as the crew I got in the 80s in a bargain bucket at a convention, I think they're from Redoubt Enterprises. These were stripped down to their shirts so they looked like they were adapting to hot conditions. So, I added more supports and braces and I now liked it again. I'd yet to put the bigger chimney stack on it but here are some work in progress pictures of the more solid looking version. I wanted to leave some gaps so that the innards could be seen. It would be madness, surely, to model and paint the working so carefully to reflect a real engine and then completely enclose them so that no one ever saw them. The machine part, the inside, was already painted. I was thinking of leaving the wood as wood, especially now I've glued the case and so I couldn't get to the innards. I used forums to discuss and receive ideas and one great suggestion was to add some sort of prow. I didn't want to go overboard, as it's meant to be a slightly engineered, low fancy gun platform more than a regiment crushing beast. So I decided to make something like those sweeping things on the front of old trains in cowboy films. It was also pointed out on various forums that the front firing door could be much better, someone suggesting a double door version. Maybe, if I could work it out, this could have some sort of windless or lever powered opening mechanism. Here you can see the wooden prow, a mantlet and a large smokestack piercing up from the engine through the upper platform. Also, the front now has double doors of a symmetrical design. I spent several days, well, fragments of several days, working out what to do about the doors. Maybe two cords attached to the outer edges could run back so that the door could be pulled open. But I was not sure that would work. Pulling the cords would just tighten the cord rather than open the doors. Maybe a pole to push them open and a hook to pull them closed. I decided to search the internet for the term scratch-built low-fantasy steam tank gun port doors to see what I could find. Surely there was bound to be something. Yeah, I'm joking, the, the worldwide internet is vast, but it's not that vast. Anyway, here it is, close to completion. I added some iron barding for strength, and in the end I worked out a simple mechanism for opening up the double firing doors. Luckily, my obscure skill set included loosetting to make the tiny ropes. The interior of the engine compartment is a squeeze, but ain't that so often the case in the real world too. Here it is, finally completed, apart from the heraldic designs and pennants I intended for its inevitable parade through the streets of Remas to hearten the populace and lessen their fears concerning the evil enemy in the north. I stained the last wooden bits, added an extra brace of swivels and glued the lower crew, rebasing the upper crewmen on timber. Now, you tell me you wouldn't be afraid if you were standing in the ranks and files with this thing bearing down on you. I like the upper crew figures a lot. Like I mentioned, the lower crew are stripped to their shirts. They're weird looking figures, but you can hardly see them anyway. Here you can see the official base size in white. I always seem to make this same mistake. I should have the base size cut out on the table while I'm scratch building as a guide and not discover afterwards whether what I've built actually fits. Finally, here you can see the ladder and the start of some work in progress barrels for powder and shot. Soon you'll see it on parade through the streets of Remas in the story videos. Next up is an ogre scrap launcher. As usual, don't ask me why, even though I'd been given most of the bits for a scrap launcher, I decided to scratch build. Is uniqueness a plus? I suppose it's just opinion. 
I started with a plastic toy rhino and lots of wooden sticks and brass chains. Some of the workings were made from plastic thingies from my bits box. I gave it some thought, not that much was necessary, because as per usual I wanted something to look like it would work. Or at least like it would work in a fantasy world. A huge weight, actually milliput, provides the force to swing the arm and a winch allows it to be reset. The access ladder has a simpler and less sturdy winch to haul it up off the ground. Several platforms allow the crew to get around it and to access the winches and the plate that holds the missiles. Here it is almost completed, with just a few little touches to sort, like the shield on the little box and the base. I did a few differently angled shots so that you can hopefully see how the mechanism would work a little better than the earlier picks. You might not believe me, and I don't blame you, but when I put this model together, it actually worked. You could wind the winch to reset the weight, and then when I pulled the weight down, the arm swung up. But when I painted and wood stained all the parts, it seized up. This made me a little bit sad, but as soon as I remembered I wasn't seven years old anymore, I got over it. In these picks, I'd forgotten to tie the two little sacks of ammunition to the side. It was a vital finishing touch, I reckon, for I was hoping this thing would shoot more than once per battle. If you've got to make a sack, use really fine linen and some uh, really fine sewing. I want to describe its mechanism properly for the edification of any Noblar engineers out there. First, here's a picture to give an idea of the scale of the engine. The ogres next to it show its relative size. It only just fits on its official base, well, legwise at least. Now for the workings. A huge lead weight hangs from the rope at the rear, leading up to the winching wheel, then around that and off to the front of the launching arm. When a certain spike is removed, the lead weight drops, pulling the rope, spinning the wheel in a satisfactorily dangerous manner for a knobler construct, for there are many ways a careless mountain goblin could die on this thing, and pulls the arm. Spinning about its axle, the arm swings up and thus launches the scrap into the air. The knoblars then wind the winching wheel to lift the weight and thus drop the arm back to be reloaded. The other winch on the machine simply pulls the ladder up. The ladder helps the other little knoblars climb up to replace the ones who perish nearly every time this thing fires. Of course, being neat and tidy little creatures, the knoblars didn't want the ladder to drag along the ground when not in use, thus the winch. The next story will be here soon, I reckon. The words are written, I just need to repose all the models for the pictures. And I've got some scenery making to do as well, I think. And then I've got to record it and edit it and add the pictures. Actually, now I think about it, it might be a little while. I hope you enjoyed this second foray behind the scenes. If you know anyone who might enjoy watching Tylea's Troubles, please do tell them. I'm not tech savvy enough to know how to lure people in using clicks and slaps and other keyboard and screen tricks, but uh, I'm happy to rely on word of mouth.